Welcome to the City Debate Show and joining me around the table today. Delighted to see him, but Andy Morrison, now with a new job. You with Andy Priest at Northwich Fix. Well done. Thanks very much. Yeah, Looking we're forward enjoying... to it, yeah. Yeah, we're enjoying it. It's hard work, but we're enjoying it. And delighted to have back around the table. Not been here for a while, I have to say. Football editor with the Daily Star Sunday, Paul Hetherington. Delighted yep. to have you back, Paul. Always delight to be here, Jimmy. Right, let me start with you, young Andrew. Manchester City, the driver's bar me, then all of a sudden they produce a performance like they did against Villa. Were you impressed? Yes, I was. Um, I thought there was, very, there was a great balance to the team on the day. Um, and, you know, lots of opportunities. And, and when they needed to dig in and, uh, you know, and, and defend, they did. And they, some nice football in that mix as well, Andy. Yeah, they have. There have been flashes this year, very often more so at home, where there's been some great phases of play. Um, but they seemed against Villa, it just seemed to be, you know, for longer periods during, especially the first half. Now then, Paul, you're a canny lad. You will have spotted this. They did it without Bellamy and Rubinho. <laughs> so is that just City being City-esque? Well, it's, it is sort of par for the course, shall we say, for Manchester City. Um, I mean, they've been like an Australian soap this season, really, haven't they? Home and away. You know, very good at home and uh, not quite so good away, shall we say. Uh, and even without, you know... The two big guns, if you like, attacking-wise, Rubinho and Bellamy, they still did the business at home. And uh, that that's, uh, must have been hugely encouraging uh, for Mark Hughes, that. Uh, because although City's home form has been excellent, you know, Villa are, are one of the teams of the season, aren't they? They're challenging for a Champions League place. It's obviously a tricky match. You wouldn't want to go into that without two important players like those two. But they cope well. That said, Andy, they were at home because no... no beaten about the bush away from home, we've been poor, haven't we? Very poor. Yeah, the, um, you know, obviously the confidence going away, because it has been the season it has, it's, um, there's a kind of like a negative thought really, you know, straight away. Uh, that would turn around with a couple of good results, you know, the confidence would come back away from home, and they're not far off. Um, you know, it's just, um, it's just that balance, just getting the balance right away from home where, you know, staying defensively and, and hopefully catching a goal on the break with Bellamy, but it just hasn't happened this year. The, the, always to me, though, Paul, if you have a situation where you're playing all your best stuff at home and very poor away from home, does it put a question mark against the character? Maybe you're looking at footballers who get you from 2-0 to 4-0, but not from 1-0 down to 1-0. That's always been the case in football, hasn't it? Um, you know, if a team has a very poor away record... Um, and particularly when it contrasts so greatly with their home form, there is that question mark placed against, uh, against the players when they go away from home. And obviously that's something which, uh, which City still have to address. Right, let's take the good things where we can find them. Last year, Andy, you and I sat around this table singing the praises of the combination of Micah Richards and Richard Dunn. That hasn't quite flourished in the way that we hoped, but it has given an opportunity to young Nader Manua. How do you think he's shaped up? Nader's had a... a for a, a period now, a problem with injuries, you know, over yeah. a two or three year period. He's never had a chance to have a run. It's always been niggly, it's been groins and uh, hernias and knees. And, um, but it looks like he's managed to get himself right now. And, uh, you know, there's no question that he always was one of the players in the academy that they were always bullish about. You know, Sean came through, Mika came through, Stevie Ireland. Naden was one of those names that were right up there, as good as anyone. Um, and, you know, he has all the attributes, he's incredibly strong. You know, one of the quickest, if not the quickest player at the club, believe it or not. And, um, you know, and now he's, he's bringing the, the, the rest of the, the uh, parts into the game, which is the confidence side, which is getting with the run of games. He's needed a run, he's got it now, and, and you know, he's one of the best young centre-halves around. And has he found his true position at centre-half then, Andy? Yeah. I think he is a centre-half. You know, the attributes that are needed to be a full-back, perhaps Nadim doesn't have that, um, you know, in the final third, attacking third of the pitch. But on a defensive, you know, you could leave him one-on-one -on -one with any striker in the league and uh, they won't get past him and they won't run him. What are the implications short-term for Micah Richards? Because he hit the ground running, Paul. He was huge and suddenly he's playing for England, being touted as one of the great prospects in English football. He's had a plateau, shall we say. He's had to go back to basics in a way. Um, Mark Hughes doesn't see him as a centre-half and he's made that clear, even though when Sven was in charge he was trying to convert him into a centre-half. Mark Hughes has made it quite clear since he came and he doesn't see him in that position. Um, and it's, it's not, the situation with Micah doesn't just apply club level, it's at international level as well, where obviously he's lost his place in the England squad. I know for a fact Capello has been disappointed with what he's seen, he expected more from him. He's had to go back to the under-21 squad, as I say, it's sort of been back to basics for him. And also, going back to the under-21s as a right-back as well. 
Now, Andy, that makes it a very interesting situation for the lad because Zabaleta's been playing in midfield and done OK, but he is a fullback. Mm -hmm. Now he's got De Jong, his midfield is more than adequately compensated for. If Zabaleta goes to right back, Nadum's playing well, Richard Dunn's playing well, what does that mean for Micah? It means Micah's got a, a battle on his hands to get a to get a starting place, and he has to make sure that when he does get that starting place, whether it's right back, centre half, wherever they play him, that he does a job, um, and and keeps the shirt. You know, and that's what it comes. That's what squads are about. You know, and it's really the form player takes the shirt, and uh, and if he does the job, he keeps it. Um, you know, Micah's got to get himself right. I don't I don't think you'll ever see any young footballer who hit the you know hit the road running like uh, Mika did without some sort of step back, yeah. without some sort of period where they need to sort of uh, readdress everything, look at they get back to basics and, and kick on again. And he will, you know, if the character's right and the work's right. And it's all, I remember Stephen Gerrard having a, a similar period um, early in his career and, uh, and it was well documented. He said, all I did was graft and work hard every day in training and made sure I was right and things will turn you away. And it'll do exactly the same for him. Interestingly enough, Paul, and I'm sure you read it, Martin Keown, who is no mean mm -hmm. centre-half himself, he said that if Mike is prepared to put that graft in and learn the skills of defending, rather than just rely on his athleticism, the combination of skill and athleticism could take him right to the very top. Well, that was very much the case probably 12 months ago when he was being talked about as a £20 million player. And other clubs were looking enviously at him, even Manchester United. Chelsea certainly was another one. So there's, there's no doubt about it. The, the potential's always been there. Um, he's just, as you sort of said before, he sort of hit a plateau, if you like. And uh, he's, he's got to sort of rebuild his career, but he's so young, isn't he? He's got plenty of time to do that. Now, Andy, most football fans like myself, we get excited when a club signs forward. So we've been talking about Bellaby, we've been talking about Rubinho. As a centre-half yourself, how would you feel about someone like De Jong playing in front of you, covering your tail? Yeah, we've been, we've been fortunate with company giving that sort of uh, that role initially and, and it's a massive part of modern-day football is um, the defensive side of um, the midfield, you know, and making sure that, um, you know, the lads who are attacking, your Rabinho, Wright Phillips and Stevie Ireland, have that insurance in the team. Um, plus, it's nice. I always think when a, when play breaks down, to have to be confronted by a midfielder, yeah. by a winger before it's actually at the back four. Problems are when play breaks down, and the first thing is a is a, is a defender is the man that's facing the next ball. Um, then you've got problems, and you won't have that with City because we have those two very strong defensive midfielders. Well, Fred Air thought, and I always trust Fred's judgment that you saw the first inkling of what De Jong is really about against Liverpool, where they spent a lot of time under the cosh. And Fred, watching that game, said he thought he was in his absolute element, flying into tackles and, come on, bring it on, I'm your man. Did you get that impression, Paul? Um, well, I, th I think uh, that performance, if you like, sort of illustrated why Mark Hughes was so determined to bring him to the club as quickly as possible. It was well documented that um, De Jong could leave in the summer for, I think he had a 1.7 million, something like that, escape clause in his contract. Obviously, City could have picked him up for a lot less money then, but Mark Hughes had identified him as, as one of his key signings, and he was determined to get him in as quickly as possible. He wanted him for this season, never mind next season, let's get it right this season as much as possible. And I think, I think people have seen, you know, particularly with that performance, as you mentioned there, Jimmy, exactly why. Now, we knew that he was going to address left-back, we knew he was going to address defensive midfield, we knew he was going to try and get a striker in, although we thought it might be Rocky Santa Cruz. We weren't absolutely certain whether he was going to go for a goalie. He did, he got Shea given. Were you pleased with that, Andy? Yeah, Shea, um, Shea's, a, Shea's a top keeper. Um, he was a young lad at Blackburn when I was there. And, um, you know, he was always destined to be a top keeper. Um, and he's gone on to do that. He's had a great career and, uh, you know, in the top three keepers in the country. Um, it'll be difficult for, for Joe Hart because he's had uh, first-team experience and nobody likes it when they've had that taste of it to actually drop back. It does feel very, very flat turning up for reserve games and that when you've had that kind of excitement of, uh, of the stadiums that he's played in. But again, it's a learning curve, you know. Um, he's still a very, very young goalkeeper um, and 28 to 32 is a keeper just coming into his prime, I guess. Um, so, you know, he's, six, he's six, seven, eight years away from that. So he's got a long career ahead of him. Well, I accept everything Andy's just said, except I'm a bloke of middle age. Joe Hart is 20, so he'll be chomping at the bit, and he's been linked with a potential move to Aston Villa. So despite that logic, he's bound to be thinking about a move like that, or the possibility of a move like that, Paul. Well, he'd, be, he'd become used to playing 
Premier League football, hadn't he? And, and English football. And, and he got in the England squad. He'd won his first cap. He was seen as you know one of the goalkeepers for the future of, of, of English football at international level. So he's, he's bound to be frustrated at the moment. You know, something he had's been taken away from him, and it was something he desperately wanted. So he's bound to be unhappy. But you would hope that uh, common sense would, not common sense, but you hope that he does see the opportunity or the potential at City because you'd like to see how his career plays out at City because if he fulfils that potential, he could be one of the great City goalkeepers, you'd have to think, Andy. Yes, and, um, and as in every day's training session and training with Shea and the other keepers there, you know, as he progresses and as they start to see that in training and in general he's starting to get close to Shea and going past him, then he's ready to go in again. And it, like you said, he's got to be patient and wait for that, wait for that time um, because keepers are, you know, very often see a keeper of that age playing in the Premier League. It's, uh, it's, a, it's what, intriguing with keepers because, as you know, Paul, mm. they don't tend to spend massive amounts of time out of the side with injuries and you don't tend to rotate good goalkeepers. No, uh, usually if a keeper gets in and he's uh, and he and he plays consistently well, he keeps the place, doesn't he? Um, I can remember Shea Given joining Sunderland in the mid '90s when when Reedy was manager at Sunderland. Shea was a, a young keeper, as, as Andy was saying at Blackburn. Reedy needed a keeper, took him to Sunderland, and he played about 15 matches in a promotion-winning season, uh, and he was absolutely outstanding. And it was quite clear then that this was Aunt Shea Given was going to be a special keeper. And, of course, he's gone on to justify that. And, and that's another reason. We were talk, talking earlier about why Sparky wanted De Jong at the club. He wanted Shea Given as well, because I think most people have felt over the last few seasons he's been the best in the Premier League. This is Andy Morrison. That is Paul Everson. This is the City Debate Show. We'll see you in two. City Debate Show with Andy Morrison and Paul Hetherington. Now, we've covered the football. Let's do a little bit of the speculation. Let me come to you, Paul, because we've been there, we've done it, we've seen it in the media, but I've never, even with City, seen us linked with four managers in one week. We had Jose Mourinho, Slaven Bilic, Diego Maradona was in there somewhere. Was it? I can't remember who the one Rafa was. Rafa Benitez, Oh, perhaps. Rafa Benitez, yeah. yeah. So is that just because you are the club, when you are the richest club in the world, somebody's got to find a story somewhere? Um, to be honest, I think there's a bit more to it than that. Uh, I mean, my information, certainly last week, was that uh, in connection with Benitez, um, obviously things aren't exactly hunky-dory at Liverpool. Not everything is right there. And uh, I was told by someone who would know that while Benitez wants things resolved the way he wants at Liverpool, he's already looking at other options if that doesn't happen. And a couple of things he's looking at, a couple of situations he's looking at, one's Real Madrid, which wouldn't surprise anyone, and the other situation is Manchester City. And what both those clubs have got is what he craves at Anfield, and that's spending power for next season. I know he's spent plenty of money while he's been there, but he's got his plans for next season. He wants to spend a lot of money again in the summer, and at the moment he can't do that. So, if we come back to reality, your Mark Hughes... What are you looking for in the back end of the season now, Andy, to give yourself a real fighting chance of still being the man picking that team come August? Got to have a good run in towards the end of the season. <clears throat> a couple of results away from home, continually um, the home form that they've had. And if they can reach that last four, maybe, of the um, UEFA Cup and sneak in there, you never know. I mean, that would be regarded as an OK, an OK season. Um, but it's a game at a time because every time City lose a game, there seems to be pressures on for the next one. And then they win a home game, then the pressure's on again when they lose the next away game. Um, and that's what he's dealing with week in, week out. You know, I, I think they feel as though they've got the right person, but results will determine. He has to get results with the squad that he's got now. Now, I suppose we could say that with the obvious exception that we expected Rocky Santa Cruz to be part of the mix, Paul, mm -hmm. this is now... Mark Hughes' side, but it's only been his side for just a little bit over his month. So, would you concur with this idea that his side now has to put in a strong finish? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, that's. I mean, that's certainly the owners will be looking for that. They'll be looking for encouraging, positive signs for next season. I think. I think Thursday night's UEFA Cup match is a big situation for City as well because City, the last English team left in the competition, they've done well in this competition. If City could win that, if they could go all the way and win it, and then finish, say, in the top seven or eight, then that would be very much an acceptable season, I would say. Well, do you know what? Something that intrigues me about the UEFA Cup, 
everybody in English football in the Premier League is struggling, struggling to qualify for Europe. And then they get in there, Andy. Apparently they can't wait to get back out again. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's basically the way, the way your season's going. I mean, if they're in there and you are such as Villa, um, who are you know, pushing for the top four, then it becomes less important. Also with the Spurs who are in there, who are, it's imperative they stay in the, in the Premier League. Um, it becomes less important. It's more important for City because we're mid-table. Um, it's the last cup that we've got a chance of, of, uh, of winning, of making a statement this season. So it is, I just think it's as the season goes on, however your season bails out really says how important the, U the UEFA Cup is for you. It's, it's interesting though, Bob, because you'd have to think that if Mark Hughes is looking to attract a better <laughs> calibre of player in the summer, one of the carrots he will want to dangle will be European mm. football. It's not going to be the Champions no. League, but the UEFA Cup, or it's going to be the Europa League next yeah. year. But he needs to find that from somewhere, surely. There is a downside to being in the UEFA Cup. Uh, it it's too flipping up. long, for one thing, isn't it? It's far too many matches. It messes up your fixture list. You, you stop playing on Saturdays, basically. Forget about that. You're playing on Sundays because you usually have a Thursday night situation or something like that. But the positive side to it is that it is seen as a, as a measure of progress if a club is, qualifies for Europe. It means you've finished in a good position, or relatively good position, in your, in your domestic league. And, and you're absolutely right. That is something that uh, a player would look to. It, players want... Top players going to a, a very wealthy club like City want to see that things are in place there. And one of the things they'd, want, they'd expect would be to be in Europe. Now, you said to me during the break something. You're, you're absolutely positive that that missing piece of the jigsaw, Rocky Santa Cruz, is City-bound in the summer. Is that something that you know? Has somebody told you something? No, I just, just the, the feeling, the vibes you hear about, like, you know, um, Blackburn were, were unable to replace him at the notice they had, and um, there was nobody around at the time. I mean, they're fighting a, a relegation battle, so he was never going to leave for me. He was never going to leave because Sam couldn't replace him, plus, you know, they needed him to get goals and to stay up. Um, and come the summer, he'll be a City player. He always cheers me up when he comes <laughs> on, Andy. Right, here's a little conundrum for you to, to solve. Manchester City at home, not too bad at all. Away from home, bobbins. We accept that. Ten games left. The ones at home, Bolton, Blackburn, Fulham, West Brom, Sunderland. Away from home, Paul, United, Chelsea, Arsenal, Everton, Spurs. So if they are going to show an improvement in away form, they're going to go the hard route, aren't they? Well, this is Manchester City we're talking about. Perhaps Probably these, win the lot. Perhaps these are the games <laughs> they've been waiting for. Um, maybe, the, you know, maybe they'll have the act together a bit better then. Maybe they'll have more of a settled side, because as you were saying earlier, this is Sparky's side now very much so. So, uh, you know, maybe the, the challenge there will, will sort of bring out the best of players like Rubinho away from home. Well, it, that is part of the... I was thinking about this, Andy, and if those fixtures were reversed and you did start to shape up away... No disrespect to West Brom, but if you start to put performances away from home against West Brom and Blackburn, that doesn't come with the same kudos that maybe making a, a fist of it against Chelsea at Stamford Bridge would bring. That's right. It's going to be. It's a big stage as well because it might mm, beating Chelsea might hand the title, or beating United might put the title race back on, back on again. Um, so there will be many twists left, without a shadow of doubt. And uh, um, as it's just been said, being City, you know, don't be surprised if uh, if they turn over two or three away from away from home and then get beat by West Brom at home. Something crazy like that could could occur. He's, got in, he's really got into this City thing, hasn't he, Andy? He <laughs> understands how this works. But it is interesting because with the type of players that they've got, the old football adage is that maybe some of the teams scrapping against relegation are going to just put two banks of four in front of you. Mm -hmm. You do tend to think against Arsenal on their own midding pole. If you've got good players, they will get a chance to play. Well, they will, because um, at the Emirates... Uh, well, I was going to say at the Emirates, anywhere for that matter. It's not, it's not Arsene Wenger's philosophy to, to put the emphasis on defence. He, he wants attacking football, positive football, entertaining football. So you know, in the, when you go to the Emirates, that Arsenal are going to come at you. But if you've got good players, if you've got players who really fancy that stage, you might be able to do them a bit of damage as well. There was one nice story in the papers this weekend, Andy. I don't know if you read it, that the owners are planning to expand the capacity of Eastlands up to 65,000. So it makes you think that... If you're thinking about crowds of 65,000, <coughs> there is really a 10-year plan in place. Yeah, I, I heard that a while ago, actually. 
Um, I heard it was more than that, but um, 65, um, you know, when that's thinking ahead. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt now that uh, the people in place are the real deal, you know, and, uh, and, and they want it to, to do all they can to make it happen and make City one of the biggest clubs in the world. So, uh, you know, any doubt that was there before, I think now has been, has been shelved and, you know, and, and they're going to do it. They're, uh, they're going to put us right where the fans want to go. Again, we come back to this conundrum, though, mm. Paul, is the timescale of expectation. Mm. Because you're talking about having a 65,000 capacity ground by 2011. But realistically, most timescales would not have you with a team that's going to compete with Manchester United or Real Madrid in that timescale, are you? No. I mean, that's, that suggests they're hopeful of, uh, of achieving a Champions League place by then, doesn't it? It, so, it does, exactly So that. that's going to make next season interesting, isn't it? But it also underlines the ambition of the owners and... Uh, as Andy says, you know, I'm certain these people are the real deal. They haven't come in here to fail. They haven't come in here to mess about or waste people's time, including their own time in particular. You know, they want to see City up there with the top clubs in Europe. Now, it's great that we've got all this money. It's great that we're talking about expanding a stadium. But as we've said many times before, Andy, a lot of City fans, myself included, love it when some of kids who've come through the ranks make it to the big time yeah. and we must pay tribute to the boy blues who are in the third fa youth cup semi-final in four years after beating norwich that's right we've, we've talked many times me and you jim about um you know what's coming through and what they're doing right at the academy um, and they continually do it right every season and um, it's incredibly um, professionally run down there you know the teams they play against they go down before uh, they stay over in hotels and uh, you know they have match analysis of the opposition it's done very well and it's um you know, and it's, it's, it's a great accolade, really, for it to, to be the holding team at the moment of the Cup and be back in the semi again. Um, and, you know, they've got a really tough game coming up, haven't they, against Arsenal. Um, and, yeah, but there's more than enough there again this year to, to, to go again. And it's been great now for, it must be the best part of five or six years now, we've been continually producing these teams. I must admit, and this is a final comment, if you would, Paul, mm -hmm. that the job that Jim Carson, Paul Power and Gibbo and the staff down there, it never fails to amaze me because mm -hmm. if City have got something right, we know all the things that they've made a pig's ear of, but in terms of academy, that is as good as it gets, you think? Yeah, the, you know, the con conveyor belt of success at that level is still running, isn't it, which is a great to see. And hopefully City will always have that sort of balance of, of home-produced talent with the big name signings. Many, many thanks as always to Andy Morrison. Always great to have Andy back round the table. And to Paul Hetherington. Manchester City, it's going to be great. The summer's going to be fantastic. And the end of this season, who knows what's going to happen. We'll follow it every step of the way right here, City Debate Show. See you next time.